Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's show, we are having a virtual field day at the OSU Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins, Oklahoma. We're going to look in on research that's being done on rose rosette disease, vegetables, and small fruits. Valley Research Station just south of Stillwater in Perkins and today we're going to look at some of the trials that they are conducting for this season. We're going to look at some rose rosette as well as some vegetables and also some fruit crops. Joining us to give us an update on rose rosette disease in Oklahoma is Jen Olson with Plant Pathology. And Jen, we're out here at the Perkins Research Station where you talked last fall about doing some trials and experiments with different cultivars. Can you elaborate on that please? Sure. So we're standing in the middle of our, our rose trial. And so these are roses that are you can go out and purchase. You may even have them planted in your landscape and we're trying to evaluate them on whether or not they are susceptible or resistant or tolerant of rose rosette disease. How many cultivars did you start with last year? So is total in here right now we have 41 cultivars. We added six this spring and so we'll be evaluating them for at least one or two more years to see if they develop rose rosette and just in that development if it if the plant dies from it or in some cases it may self prune or or just take care of itself. So what were you finding at the end of last year, the first year? So last year we in the fall in September, we took some infected rose pieces and sort of push them into the center of our plants mm -hmm. in as a method of getting those mites to crawl off that carry the virus. You're intentionally trying right. to inoculate. Trying to yes. inoculate and get these infected. And in November, we had out of, we have 144 plants, I think. Um, we have one symptomatic plant. And this spring, we're starting to see the disease pop out on lots of different plants. I think that inoculation took. And now that we have it in these plots, mm -hmm. it's gonna start to spread plant to plant. And so what we find is we often have pockets of disease. This row that we're standing in front of, one plant's uh, symptomatic, the next one's healthy, these two are symptomatic. And that'll probably be the pattern that we start to see. And, that, and that's kind of what happens in a neighborhood too. Your neighbor might get it, your rose might be healthy. Come next year, your exactly. rose might have it. So w let's talk about some of the symptoms again. Um, so there's, while we have one here in front there's of There's different types of symptoms. Um, often when, plant, when roses come out in the spring, you may see a red color to the foliage that's normal. Mm -hmm. And as the plant, um, as those leaves mature, it, the red color goes away. And often if it's rose rosette, the red color just doesn't go away. And within that discolored area, you often find stunting, distortion. There's what we call a witch's broom where lots of shoots are coming out from one point. Um, and so identifying that tells you that that plant is infected with rose rosette. Now there was talk about being able to prune out some of that disease and potentially save your shrub. So there are trials looking at pruning as a method to remove rose rosette that are going on in Tennessee. And they're just finding it's not that effective. The trials aren't complete. It's probably gonna be somewhere between 25 to 40% effective. Those numbers may change a little, mm -hmm. but it's just not that effective. And unfortunately what you find is if this rose, if we started to prune it, mm -hmm. 
We already have early symptoms on this other section of the rose where the leaves are just starting to look a little bit different. They're, they're a little bit more yellow. They're a little bit misshapen compared to a normal rose. So you might prune out what's obvious, but miss these early symptoms. And remember, this is a, a virus that's transmitted by a mite that we can't see. Yeah, you're not just trying to remove the insect. Right. The virus the, is already in the plant. Right. And the mites may have already crawled to the other side of the plant. This virus actually goes into the root system, so it can pop out anywhere. Okay. And so for that reason, we don't just recommend pruning. It is recommended to remove and discard that plant because this is a new rose, mm -hmm. younger plant that it's a replacement that we put in this year. And it's very likely that this is going to just spread to this next plant. So if you take one out, um, you may want to hold off on replanting and try to treat those mites. The only thing labeled for home gardeners is horticultural oil. And so using that, try to reduce those mite populations and wait and make sure that you don't see it popping up on any other roses in your landscape. Get the disease under control and then you can focus on replacement. And of course, here with your research, you want the disease to we be here. We want the disease. Because you're trying to find the one that is resistant to it. So, right. And so, you're not just doing it here in Perkins either. No, we have, um, Dr. Snelly and I have a trial that's actually in Wichita, Kansas. Um, and then I have trials in Tulsa at the Municipal Rose Garden. That's a really big trial. There's over a thousand rose plants in one of the terraces there that we're looking at different uh, types of plants for rose rosette, so. All right, well, thank you for sharing this yep. update. us next is Dr. Lynn Brandenberger, the vegetable extension specialist. And Dr. Brandenberger, you're doing some research on cabbage out here. You bet. Please tell us about the cabbage trials you have going on. Well, it's it's been at least 10 years or longer since we did a cabbage trial. And uh, cabbage in the state of Oklahoma is used mostly by fresh market growers to sell locally. Mm -hmm. So it's an important crop for them. Uh, it's an early season crop. Right. Uh, this crop loves cold, wet conditions. These were planted in mid-March, I believe? Yeah, yeah. So what what are your trials that you're replicating here? You have so many cultivars? Yeah, I think we've got 17 different cultivars. We've got uh, quite a few green ones. We've got some that are red, and then we've got some savoys, which are the crinkly leaf. I think that's one of them right back behind us here. And, uh, you know, they're both used for processing and fresh market. So all these varieties that we're testing potentially be used in in Oklahoma. So temperatures are warming up they're starting to head out a little bit so right. what will you do to trial them at that point? With well we're right at the kind of beginning of the harvest season because these varieties vary from I think about 80 days on you know 100 and some day mm -hmm. cabbage and so the earlier ones are probably will be harvested next week. Okay. Now they look pretty healthy. We've got a cabbage loopers yeah. though, and yeah, you yeah, seem yeah. to be winning the battle so far. Well, that's because of Linda, you know, <laughs> she, she takes care of the plots. But uh, essentially she sprayed these, I think three times with spinosad, okay. which is, if not, it is nearly organic. Okay. And you could use uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. Yeah, you could use BT. BT. That's another one. Okay. Uh, and so she's kept a real close eye on them. It's time for another spray. Mm -hmm. uh, we had folks that were picking off cabbage loopers today, <laughs> so we know we, we need to spray. But uh, we're just kind of IPM it. We're looking at the crop, we're deciding when to spray, and then we spray. And we spray at the right time of the day because we have some bees on the on the uh, station now and we want to protect them. So we spray late in the afternoon or very early in the morning before they're up. Okay, so when we harvest these, what is it that you're looking for as a product basically? Other than it's edible yeah, uh, well, <laughs> and it, it's tasty, what else are you looking for that you'll evaluate? Uh, well, one thing we look for like on this head and it's, it's not quite done, but the head, if you squeeze it, it's very firm. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's fairly dense. And uh, we, we'd like a head of cabbage that's, you know, got a nice shape to it. We'll, when we actually harvest that head, we'll cut it, you know, off at the base of the, of the head. 
and then we'll maybe take a circumference of the head mm -hmm. and then we might even cut it right down the middle vertically and then we look and see how long the, the growth is inside of it, the growing point inside of the head. Okay. Uh, so that's important and then of course how uh, compact and, and thick it is, you know, we don't want some head that's real loose. And, because the more dense it is, the more cabbage, more cabbage you got. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you know, you could take a small cabbage like that that's real dense and make a coleslaw. <laughs> and you've also got some peppers that you've seeded, direct sown out into the garden. Right. Why would you be researching that? Well, we um, have commercial growers in the state that grow several hundred acres of peppers, mm -hmm. and so one of the problems they've got is the cost of that. You know, it runs anywhere two to three hundred dollars an acre just to get the plants in the ground. That's before anything else happens. Yeah. And so it'll help bring that cost down. Uh, the other problem that we've seen is we have some trouble with bacterial spot, and we're starting to suspect that maybe it kind of comes with the transplants. Oh, okay. And so it would cut that transplant growing part out of it and hopefully we might end up with a healthier crop even. So. And that's obviously still early on in that trial, but this is right. going to be wrapping up pretty soon. Right. So where can viewers find that information when it's available? Uh, they can go to our vegetable trial report and that vegetable trial report is uh, on our department's website. You just go and you go to OK, what is it, Hortla, okstate.edu and then just kind of go from there. Go to the vegetable section and you'll find it. Excellent. Thank you for sharing this research with All us. All right. Thank you. We also wanted to look at the sweet corn trials here at the Cimarron Valley Research Station in Perkins. And joining us is Linda Carrier, who is the senior research specialist that's responsible for these trials. Linda, please tell us what you're doing out here with this. Okay, well this year we're doing a, another sweet corn variety trial. We try to do them about every year. And we look at different types of corn in our studies each year and look to see which ones perform the best in our climates. So do you have different cultivars that, what are you, what cultivars are you using? We are using what they call SE varieties, which are sugary enhanced. Okay. And these varieties are known for having extended sugar in them compared to old varieties from the past. Um, the original varieties back in the day were just the sugary varieties and they really had no sugar in them. They were very starchy. <laughs> So, so we've enhanced the sweet flavor yes, in sweet corn. Yes, we have, yes. Okay, now these aren't GMOs or anything, right? No, none of these are. Okay. Uh, we have used some in the past in trialing, but this year we are not. So. And, and there's another group of corn you're also looking uh -huh. at? Yeah, it's a SH2. Um, we're not using those this year, but some of these SEs have a combination of them in them. Uh, the trade names on them are, are either triple sweet or uh, super sweets, um, okay. and those have a combination of 75% SE and 25% SH2s. Okay, so for homeowners who are interested in getting sweet sweet corn, uh -huh. they should be looking on the packaging for these yeah. categories yeah. of yeah. corn? Yeah, that's true. The SEs and the differences between the SEs and the SH2s, um, the SEs are very sugary. They have an extended shelf life. The SH2s are probably more extended on their shelf life, but they also are harder to get started. They don't like cold temperatures. They don't like real wet conditions. Okay, so that's why they're trying to kind of cross some of them to get the yeah. best of both of them. Right, those. to get the best of both worlds, yeah. All right, well, we will check back and see how sweet the sweet corn is a little okay. later in the summer. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Blackberries are a favorite in Oklahoma, and joining us is Becky Carroll, who is a senior agriculturist who's doing research on our blackberries out here. Can you tell us what you're finding? Well, we've got a lot going on this year. Um, we've got some, some diseases showing up a little bit because of our cool, wet spring. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of moisture. So some of these spots that you might find on the, the floor canes or the fruiting part, um, kind of purplish or gray spots, those are anthracnose. Fungicide applications will take care of that. Okay. Um, we've also seen um, some leaf cupping on some of some of our primocane or the the new canes that are coming up. And um, so there's a picture or there's a 
example right here and and a few of the leaves are curling on the edges and we're just today uh, we had those identified as as caused by broad mites which is a brand new pest for blackberries here in Oklahoma uh, they've been finding them in Arkansas over the last couple of years but this is the first time we've seen them in Oklahoma so um, we're not exactly sure how we're gonna actually recommend control yet but we're working on that and uh, if anybody's having problems with leaves that are are cupping upward mm -hmm. that's probably what they're seeing and, and I'd love to know if there's pockets or locations where they're finding leaves like that. So we're kind of looking for yeah. that now mm -hmm. in Oklahoma um, and there's other insects that we've been dealing with. Right in the past you know blackberries have pretty much been an organically grown crop you didn't have to worry about spraying too much unless it's anthracnose. I or, used to go pick wild yeah, blackberries yeah, all if, the time. If you pick them in in the wild in the pasture or along the roadsides uh, you can still do that you just may get a little extra protein with some <laughs> of your um, berry collections. So what is it that's in some of these berries? That... It's called uh, SWD or spotted wing drosophila mm -hmm. and it's a, a type of fruit fly that infects really nice berries. Usually fruit flies infect overripe or damaged fruit mm -hmm. and the SWD it will actually uh, slice into fresh nice berries and lay eggs inside. So where we, we never have had a problem with that unless you've had damaged fruit or overripe or something with regular fruit flies. This is affecting a lot of the, the uh, good berries. And all the monitoring that has been done in the last couple of years has been showing pretty high populations in most all of our blackberries especially. Okay. They it's like not going to harm fruits. you if you do it's not eat it. Harm you, you won't even notice them. You don't see you, them, right? You won't notice them that much. There may be a little bit of sunken area on some of the berries, but um, if you, you may notice them if you put them in your refrigerator in a bag. They may like crawl out of the berries. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. it's, it's not something you really want to think about, but mo more than likely you're going to have them in your plantings or in your your canes if you're growing blackberries. So how can we prevent them from... Well, the, the best thing I would suggest would be plant a early ripening blackberry. The, the fly populations are a lot less early in the season and as you get later mm -hmm. the populations build up. They can have one life cycle in about a week or 10 days. It's, it's pretty quick turnover um, and so Early season, there's not as many, so you're not gonna have as many infected berries. Later season, have more. But uh, what we're recommending now is a weekly spray. When the berries start to color, when they start to turn blue, you're gonna want to, or even before they turn blue, start applying a weekly insecticide, Malathion, Mustang Max. There are a few organic options in Trust and Pyganic, mm -hmm. and they'll, most of them have a one day pre-harvest interval so you can spray them 24 hours later they're okay to eat. Um, some of the other options are three days so you'd have to wait before you could eat those if you spray them with another option. Okay. So there are options where you can spray them and then and eat them the next day. All right well but, so we might want to spray our homegrown yeah. blackberries. And it will be weekly through the end of harvest. Okay thank you for sharing right. with us. All of this information and more was presented at a field day. Field days are a great opportunity for the general public to come and see firsthand what OSU is researching. You can keep track of when a field day might be coming to your area by checking out our upcoming events. This is lettuce and hominy salad day. Now this is a little bit unusual because we're gonna make a, a green salad with a dressing, but we're not gonna use as much of the normal ingredients as we usually do. So the first thing I'm gonna start with is cannellini beans. We're gonna put the dressing together and blend it. So this is not going to be a high fat dressing, but it is gonna be a fairly high protein salad. It's also gonna be uh, a good source of fiber because we have all those beans in there. So in addition to that, I'm gonna put a fourth of a cup of diced jalapeno, 
Now these are in the blender, so you don't have to spend a, a lot of time getting them all to a perfect ice because they are gonna blend and it's gonna come down uh, during that process. Also gonna add a fourth of a cup of cilantro, a fourth of a cup of fresh lime juice, and I really encourage you to use the fresh on this, about a fourth of a cup of hot water because we need more liquid to get the blender moving, one garlic clove that you've just cut in half. Again, this is because it's gonna get blended and it's gonna be uh, cut down to size in there. Uh, a half a teaspoon of kosher salt and just a small amount of olive oil. I've got one tablespoon of olive oil and that's really a small amount for a dressing as most of you undoubtedly know. And then a, a little bit more seasoning. I've got a teaspoon of your favorite hot sauce or in this case, my favorite hot sauce. We're just going to put the lid on the blender and then you're going to blend this until it's smooth, which uh, may take, to be patient with it because you don't want it to have uh, the taste or the texture uh, of the bean that's just been masked. You want it to actually come down until it's nice and smooth. So probably take at least a minute. At this point, check it, make sure that it's still smooth. Uh, don't worry about uh, precisely how it tastes because we're gonna add so many other ingredients, but do taste it to make sure that the texture's good. I've done that on this one. It's, it's smooth enough uh, for my liking. So uh, we let it go for at least a minute. It's gonna depend on your blender. You could do it in a food processor as well. So we'll set that aside. You could actually do that part ahead, put it in the refrigerator. You might have to stir it together a little bit before you actually uh, do the salad. This salad serves six. They're gonna be big servings, so you may wanna plan, if you choose smaller servings, you may wanna plan on it serving 10 or even 12 if they're very smaller, uh, quite a bit smaller salads. So uh, I've got about a pound of uh, romaine lettuce. I want a sturdy lettuce for this because it's a little bit of a thicker, heavier dressing, so I want something that's gonna be able to hold up to it. It's also got a lot of flavor in that dressing, uh, so I need some uh, greens that are gonna contribute their own flavor too. So the romaine is gonna hold up and, and do nicely. I'm also going to use uh, a head or a, basically a small head of radicchio. Now if you don't have radicchio you can use uh, red leaf lettuce. It will give you some of the color as well. Uh, the reason I like the radicchio is it's got uh, some bitterness to the flavor uh, that's uh, going to be a lot different. It's also uh, fairly sturdy and so it's going to hold up nicely as well. I'm going to mix these together just a little bit to get them kind of uh, started in the mixing and then we'll add in the other ingredients to it uh, as well. Uh, also to this, this is one of the store ingredients as you might have guessed from the lettuce and hominy salad title. This is hominy. Uh, they start with usually uh, large kernels of field corn. Uh, it's dehydrated and then it's soaked in a, a slaked lye, lime or a lye solution. Um, and it has a couple advantages. This is a, a really traditional ingredient, particularly in Mexican culture. Uh, the, uh, soaking it in, in the alkaline solution actually uh, prevents the germ from sprouting. And so this would enable them, because this, the hominy after it's soaked for a while would often have been dried so they could use it to make masa. Uh, and that prevents it from sprouting. So that would enable them to hold it over a much longer time. It also has a definite advantage in that it frees the uh, niacin uh, in the corn so that your, your body is able to absorb it much better. And in the cultures where they were using this type of process, they did not find the incidence of pellagra that they found in the southern U.S. who didn't know to do this. So there's another big advantage to it from that standpoint. Uh, I'm using canned. Uh, the, the process of soaking it and so on is probably not something that most of us are going to want to do. The canned varieties come in the white I have here, they come in yellow, they come in blue, they come in red, which those are going to be more difficult to find. Uh, but you have a lot of options there. It makes it really easy. I've got a cup of shredded carrots uh, that I'm going to add to that. Three green onions. So you can see this has a lot of color, it's really nice. And then I'm gonna save the uh, olives to add a little bit later, but I've got a third of a cup of ripe olives. Now this much you could do, you could cover and keep in the refrigerator again until you're ready. And then you're gonna pour on as much dressing as you think you might want. Always with a salad, start with a little bit less than um, the recipe may need in the end because you don't wanna overdress it. And then just stir that in together. And when you get that salad well covered, then if you had sufficient, then what you would do is serve the rest of the dressing on the side in case you have a guest who, or a family member who thinks that 
you didn't dress it as well as it should have been and they would really like some more. So this is a really easy salad to do. As I said, you have a lot of color in here, a lot of nutrition. This can be a main dish salad. And in that respect, it's different than what we usually think of of main dish salads, which either have beans that you can see uh, or meat or poultry added to them or eggs or cheese. So uh, this one's a little bit different. I hope you'll like it. I'm gonna sprinkle the olives over the top just so we keep that black color up where we can see it. And that's all there is to it. It's ready to serve. Lettuce and hominy salad for Oklahoma Gardening. This is Barbara Brown. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>